right. <laughs> Welcome to Making Music. I'm Gary Weinroth from Guitar Showcase. And uh, today we're about Fender amplifiers. And uh, with me today, we have uh, some people from Fender again. Uh, on my right, Shane Nicholas. The, Hello. The, uh, Marketing manager for amplifiers for all of Fender, right? Yes, sir. All right, and and uh, on your right we have the famous Mark Blasquez. He's the regional sales manager district for Fender. District sales manager. Or district, Don't excuse go me. Don't give me a promotion. Though. Okay, no promotions. Okay, for <laughs> our area here in in the Bay Area. And on my left over here we have a hired gun from Guitar Showcase. We have Jack Van Breen on bass guitar, and uh, he's he's to help us out a little bit here. So. Shane, talk to us about the history. I mean, we've done the history somewhat of the Fender guitar, you know, from uh, the custom shop and that sort of thing, but now the amplifiers, where did this all start? Well, there was a guy named Leo Fender who was uh, handy with a soldering iron, and he enjoyed electronics, and uh, he kind of built a business for himself in Southern California doing PA systems and small amplifiers for pretty much all purpose. I mean, he made PA systems for you know, sporting events, political rallies, churches, schools, whatever. And he became friendly with a lot of Western musicians uh, that would kind of be coming through looking for something a little louder or a different sound or whatever. Uh, and he began making uh, the first Fender products, which were small amplifiers and lap steels. Uh, so a lap steel was actually the forerunner of, you know, the Fender electric guitar. Yeah. It was basically a slab of uh, you know hardwood with a few strings on it and an this, amplifier. So this guitar, uh, this amplifier over here, this little tweed, that's a Champ. Yeah, this is a this, this guy right here. This is a late '50s uh, Fender Champ, which is a little tiny. Uh, it's probably a five watt amp with a either an eight inch or a six inch speaker in there. And at that time, that was enough to make it electric. That and was it. If you were you know if you were as loud as a piano or a trumpet, you were you were pretty darn loud at that time. Uh, so it, it kind of all started from there, and uh, you know, if 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 you like, we can we can hear this amp here and I'd talk love, a little bit. Love to hear it. Let's let's hear that now. For a period piece, uh, what what guitar sort of went with that amplifier in those days? Well, Leo Fender would have made this amp with a lap steel. Uh, okay. You know, playing Western swing music or Hawaiian music or whatever cowboy music. Uh, but at the very dawn of amplification. Really what people wanted to do was they just wanted to make a, uh, an acoustic guitar louder. I need a chord, please. Um, this is a, happens to be a Gretsch guitar, which uh, uh, would have been around the same time that Leo Fender was getting started. This is a little you know, more recent model, obviously. But anyway, if you think of... Now imagine you have an acoustic guitar, and you're playing in a, in a dance band, in a, in a you know, ballroom or a, you know, a club or wherever it is, and you're playing rhythm guitar in a band, and you're... Okay, and if the dancers in the back of the room could hear this little... You know, you were part of the rhythm section, it was okay. It was kind of descended from the banjo, you know, right, per se. Right. But when the guitar players began putting pickups on an acoustic guitar and having an amplifier and being able to have a little bit of volume... Now they were being able to be heard in the back of the room better, but they were also able to take solos. So, okay, so if they were as loud as the trumpet, again, they were now a solo instrument in a large ensemble. Some of these bands like Bob Wills and, and uh, uh, Hank Thompson and these kind of bands, they might have had between 10 and 20 people on stage. On stage, yeah. Right, so <laughs> what starts happening is these players start turning up the amps louder. And now we're going to turn the guitar all the way up and, yeah, probably, yeah. So now, if I'm turned down low, it's still all right, but you turn it up and it distorts like crazy. The tubes are distorting and the speaker's distorting. Um, and that became a sound that rockabilly players, blues players, and of course into the, the birth of rock and roll, you know. <laughs> So there's, there's a whole recorded history of music of people turning an amp, what Leo Fender would say, too high. <laughs> <laughs> Causing it to distort. Exactly. But that is a sound now. That's, that's the sound. So where do we go from there? We grew them. I, obviously, we got a little bigger over here, I see. 
Yes, we did. Um, what year is that amplifier? Is that that's an original is, from the Showcase Collection? That's about what 1950 or so. Uh, this would be a late 50s. Late 50s. Uh, you know, people who are into Fender stuff, people who are connoisseurs, will call this a narrow panel lamp, I meaning it has this narrow uh, panel of tweed here. Uh, tweed being the covering, mm -hmm. and Fender made amps of all sizes of that basic cosmetic treatment for a number of years in the 50s. Uh, Fender today, we make a really nice amp called the 59 Baseman LTD, which that's is this, this guy, guy over here to the uh, to my right. And that's a reissue of that's an original tweed. Brand new re uh, amplifier that's made to uh, look and sound like a 1959 amp. And I think I'm going to plug that in just because it's so good. Swap guitars here and swap amplifiers. You know, it's important that we hear these because to talk about it is one thing, to hear it is quite another, and uh, I think it's important that everybody gets to hear the differences in the sounds, and it's a, it's a good thing. Okay, now this amp is called a Bassman. Right. It was originally designed for someone to play bass, whether an upright bass or, you know, a Fender electric bass. The, the electric, bass. right. And at the time, they turned the amp up a little bit, and they had a bassy sound on the, on the guitar or the bass, and got that tone. But then, uh, again, guitar players being, you know, a little radical at the time would crank that thing. Okay, so you crank that amp up loud and it, it really distorts quite a bit. And sustains. And sustains. <laughs> uh, cool. And what you're hearing there again is the tubes themselves overdriving and the speakers overdriving and the amplifier probably turned up uh, past the point where uh, musicians of the day uh, in the 50s were accustomed to, but it became a sound that was recorded and you, you get on into the Beatles and Hendrix and Cream and Led Zeppelin and all these bands and the guitar sound got more and more and more distorted. And by the end of the 60s, you know, what we think of, what you and I think of as, a, as a, an electric guitar tone was set in stone. Absolutely. So, and it started with that little guy up there. It started with all this stuff. Yeah. It's amazing. So now tell me, to do these reissues, what do you do? Do you actually take the old ones and, and make some things better and some things the same? And we, we, we do all of that. Um, we're, we're, fortunate, we're fortunate enough now that uh, in the in the 80s and 90s, uh, uh, guitar play I mean guitar collecting I should say collecting of vintage instruments uh, had gotten to the point where people started looking at the amplifiers. You know, it used to be that you know a really nice uh, old Fender guitar was getting to be thousands of dollars, but the amplifier was still cheap. Right. And it's really not like that today. Um, some of these vintage pieces they're really hard to find in original condition because people have you know, cut holes in them and painted them other colors. And so we're lucky enough to, to know people such as Gary here, yourself, who, uh, who have a collection of some of these pieces. And uh, uh, I work out of the Scottsdale, Arizona office. We actually uh, have a couple of local uh, players that do own a lot of the old stuff. So uh, when we're doing an amp such as, uh, you know, one of these reissues, we'll listen very closely to the old ones. There's some things that we can't do for modern safety regulations and modern manufacturing regulations. There's some things that you can't do. Right. Because rock and roll is supposed to be a little dangerous. <laughs> so we don't, we don't want to shock the guy. I remember in the old days, I'd, I'd touch a cymbal or I'd touch uh -huh. a mic stand if I had my hands yeah. on my guitar strings. It'd light yeah. me up like a Christmas tree. You know, so we, you don't do that to us two, anymore? Two prong power chords no are more. out. No more. Um, yeah. Uh, in fact, it's actually getting to the point where uh, uh, safety uh, regulatory agencies don't even want you to be able to, to do anything. They don't want you to be able to change a fuse. Right. Uh, so we really have to kind of take all that into account. But we make them to deliver the essence and the spirit and the basic you know, voice of what those amps uh, Absolutely. originally sounded like. And I, th and I think you can hear the difference. Oh, you do. Now, Mark, you sell these to mm -hmm. various dealers, not just Guitar Showcase. Sure throughout California, Northern California. So are, do you find that the reissues are, are popular? 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the reissue is kind of addressed uh, a couple things that was going on. First of all, I think people started to miss that old pure tone that was happening. Right. The amplifiers got to a point where they became so complicated and so processed that people went, wait, didn't rock and roll used to sound a lot better than this? And uh, it was that. And then, you know, then another thing <laughs> yeah. that was happening is there were so many other companies out there. I think it happens a lot with, with Fender in general. They, they will do sort of knockoffs or Frankenstein versions of our guitars. There were a lot of other companies out there building very expensive, exotic, Fender-esque Boutique things. amplifiers. Yeah, I mean, you know, and the market will really speak to you very clearly. Like, look, people want this. They now want we have eBay that we can look at, and Shane and I were just talking earlier about, you know, how much does a does a real 57 basman go for now versus, you know, This reissue, so street yeah. price on the reissue basement. This has four tens in it. Yeah, um, this is, yeah. Li U.S. list is about sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars I don't have it all, them all memorized. Yeah, but and yeah. MAP is around 13 yeah. or something. Yeah, in that Somewhere around the park. Park. Yeah, and an, uh, an original. I know we have a couple in our collection. I believe they're pushing about ten grand or better, aren't they? If it's, if it's original, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the other thing that people forget is these amps, you know, Leo Fender or anybody who was making amps in the, in the 50s or, or beyond, they weren't making collector pieces. They right. were making stuff that you would take out and play every night throw in the trunk of the car, beat the crap out of it, and, and you know, hopefully it holds up and continues for years and years of service. So they that's did. why it's so hard to find yeah. you know, an original one that someone hasn't painted a different color or mm -hmm. mounted a mic stand to it or <laughs> <laughs> right. whatever, cut in half. Yeah, so. some of these are, or it's amazing to see them in this condition here. That's, you know, it just, it's gotta be a, a piece of history there. And I know a lot of people copy this. Yep. I've seen other manufacturers even copy the tweed. They, Absolutely. Yeah, they put that on there and you know, and, and, and some of them do a good job and some of them not so good. But it really it just says something. It really kind of captures and speaks to a certain era, right? A tweed amplifier really just says that that's who you are as a guitar player, right? right. I mean, if you right. get the choice between one that looks like this and looks like that, if they perform the exact same functions, one guy would want this one because that's the way it looks. And, and we have some magic involved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, there's always as, magic. As in the guitars, you know? Yeah, I, I'd like to point out a little bit, too, that, that the, these, are, these are getting more rare and they're beautiful to look at, but the real reason that any of us are talking about this right now is because of the musical part of it. They sound great. And the reason that people still love these amplifiers and guitars 50 years after they were built you know, it's the same reason that people like old cameras or old cars. You get in a 57 Chevy or a 68 Charger and you hit the gas pedal and it's yeah. like, man, it's, yeah. a, it's a thrill. Yeah. And playing an amplifier like a 59 Basement is the same type of thing. I mean, just, just having that amp set, you know, maybe two thirds of the way up, I can play clean, I can play jazzier stuff. I can go back on my treble pickup and crank it up a little bit. Okay, I can play hard rock. I can do almost anything I want just by manipulating the, gu the guitar's controls and how hard I play. Yeah, there's no computers involved in that. There's no foot switches, no effects pedals, no nothing. That's all a Fender guitar and a Fender and amp. And a Fender amp. Yeah, you don't need anything other than that. And that thing sounds great. That's yeah. a modern incarnation. Brand yeah. new amp you can buy today. Buy right. today. It came yep. off the floor at Guitar Showcase. Absolutely. So that's, a, that's a great amp. Yep. So that's, that's interesting. Well, then we went forward to the black faces. Well, we had some brown faces in the middle there a little bit, but talk to me about these now. Okay, well, probably the quintessential Fender amps of all time, and by quintessential I mean uh, what the most recordings have been made with, uh, what you'll still see today on stages all around the world are what we call the blackface amps. And I have behind me a Super Reverb here. This happens to be about a 65, uh, but we have a current reissue you do of a this reissue amp of that. that you can okay. buy today. It sounds virtually identical to this one. Uh, here is a brand new uh, reissue of the 65 Deluxe Reverb. Um, if you've heard of the Beatles or Elvis, you've heard this amp on a record. It's Definitely. one of the most recorded amps of all time. Uh, it has an absolutely beautiful clean sound. <laughs> It's got reverb, which is the old-fashioned spring reverb. 
which means there's a pan with springs in there jangling around and then those get amplified. So the old surf music. Okay. It's also got a tube driven uh, tremolo effect. Okay, so throughout the 60s, amplifiers were starting to get a little more features, a little more effects, uh, a little more cleaner sound too, meaning you could push them hard and play loud. Uh, you know, guys would be playing a, you know, a rodeo or a state fair or something with just, you know, an amp like a super reverb and they could, they could be heard. Enough horsepower, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and these, and these amps really became... Yeah, in their own way, they really defined the sound of rock and roll. And then they really became kind of the springboard for, for a lot of the modern amplifiers. A lot right. of other very successful uh, amp companies will very openly kind of tip their hat towards Fender. You know, we started off, our first thing was kind of one of these that we just tweak some bells and whistles on. And it's, uh, so these, are, these things aren't only historic with Fender, but they're historic and significant in regards to modern music in general. I mean, this is so much of what you'll see on the shelves in any music store really oh, started absolutely. You know, absolutely. with this stuff. And so. you've, uh, you've gotten to the point now where, well, you know, Leo Fender started out with just a radio repair shop or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was just kind of a dweeb that just kind of did, you know, amplifiers and radios and things, built his amplifier. Then he built kind of the, he started the solid body electric guitars like the Tele, mm -hmm. kind of a, and then he went to the Strat and kept growing and as he grew, he kept growing the amplifiers with it. One of the few companies, a lot of people made guitars, tried to put a name on an amplifier, but nobody really succeeded. So it was not uncommon throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever, and still today to see another guitar plugged into a Fender amplifier. And when you see a Fender, you generally see it plugged into a Fender amplifier. So you guys have kind of got it both ways. You've got everybody else using your amps, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of cool, you know. Yeah, and it's absolutely. Uh, and gosh, all the all the famous people, you know. And, and uh, I know the date that we're filming this today is uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan's birthday, you know. And, yep. and yes, he was he was known for playing the Super Reverb and the Vibroverb, which is another amp that we have a reissue of. Absolutely. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work with a guy named Caesar Diaz, who was Stevie's tech. And he basically came into the Fender offices and said, hey, I'm sick of taking these 40-year-old amps and trying to modify them to do these supposedly famous modifications. Why don't we just do an amp together? And, and that's what we did. Excellent, excellent. So that worked out too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's hear another amplifier. What else have you got here that is a, is a segue between the old and the new? Well, okay. we, go ahead. Uh, I was going to mention, just even though it's, it's not a historic amp at all, I would like to mention the supersonic in this uh, sort of historic episode. Because we are going to do another show. This is like kind of like the Fender Custom Shop. We have to yep. do two shows to cover the amplifiers because next week we'll do the, uh, the more modern stuff. But Absolutely. this is, uh, this looks a little narcotic here. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of got a, a killer, killer grill cloth and, and everything. It's just... Uh, yeah, the supersonic is, I'm mentioning it now because this is an example of uh, at Fender, we care very, very much about our history. We have a 60-year history of making guitars and amps that, you know, the world loves. But we can't stay mired in 1964. You know, we've got to we've got to keep on progressing and keep on uh, delivering things that musicians want to play. So, for me, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the Supersonic because it has some of the elements of the history of Fender. And uh, we'll just turn this on a second here. Now this, this version is a, uh, a head and a separate speaker cabinet version and then we also have this blonde one over here which is a, um, a combo which is a single 12 inch speaker but these both have the ability to, uh, to, to basically call up the sounds of a few famous Fender amps. Uh, we keep talking about tube amps also just for those of you uh, in the viewing audience that forgot about this or, or are a little younger this is a vacuum tube. Can we get a close-up of that? You got it? Okay. This is a little glass bottle with a whole bunch of little serious metal parts inside it. Now, I'm not that old, but when I was a kid, you still had to come home after school, turn on the television, and wait a minute for it to warm up. Yeah, a couple minutes. And my mom's old <laughs> RCA TV had a whole bunch of these tubes in there, and this was how amplification was done. 
uh, for every electronic product until pretty much the 60s and 70s. They gradually got phased out. So we guitar players are some of the only people on the planet who care about this anymore. Still use it. Yeah. And that's the thing that takes the uh, little tiny magnetic signal from an electric guitar and turns it into energy that you can that you can amplify. So. And they make transistors that do that, but they yeah. don't do it the same way. Right. We, we're we lucky enough to be able to say that at Fender we kind of have it all. If you're a, you know, if you're a Rolex watch, uh, vintage automobile kind of person, we have, you know, custom instruments that, that are either remakes of old uh, models or artist models or art pieces that have, you know, famous artists paintings on them or, or you know, the, the limit is your imagination. But we also make products for beginners. We sell more beginner guitars than anyone in the world. We sell more beginner amplifiers than anyone in the world. Um, but this one is, is pretty much aimed at a professional, the Supersonic, or the, what? The Supersonic would be aimed at a, at a pro. It's, it's uh, I think of it as an uncomplicated amp that has a lot of different tones in it. So what we did in this guy is we basically lifted the circuit, uh, the actual tube circuit of a Blackface Vibrolux, which a Vibrolux is a smaller version of the Super Reverb. Has a really nice, bright, clean, Okay, this is an amp that uh, people like Roy Buchanan and Stevie Ray Vaughan and uh, ma many players have used the sound of a Vibrolux, uh, Mark Knopfler. And then you go over to the basement, which is, as we said before, a basement is an amp that has a little more grunt, a little more bottom end to it, it's a little more powerful. So compared to that sound that I just played, the basement has a little more, a little more oomph to it. And I, I consider the basement like the quintessential rhythm guitar amp. I mean, it's, it's shaking the stage. So again, I have my little, and I have my, so I have those two sounds covered. Then I'm going to hit the button a third time, and this is all foot switchable, by the way. I don't have the foot switch hooked up. But you go to the third channel, and we call it the burn channel, which is based on some high gain amplifiers that we did over the years. Um, and it's an all tube, high gain, dual preamp uh, design. <laughs> Okay, and then we have really wide ranging tone controls, so I can get a fuzz tone if I want. I can scoop out the mids and turn the bass all the way up and do the teenager tuning. <laughs> it works. You get the point. Yeah. Yep. Loud enough to bother everybody within a couple of square blocks. So, Absolutely. so we feel that in, in, a, in a professional amplifier that's simple to use, but gives you three or four of the main sounds that you would need to play almost any type of music, it, it really nails it. That's great. Really. Well, you know, we're, time flies. We've only got about three minutes to go. So let's fire up whichever weapon you guys want and let's end with a song. You got about three minutes to play here. Only three. Because that is what we like to hear on making music. <laughs> a little music here. That sounds good. That's Shane, great. Mark, are you back in your super? You want to go? Are you plugged device? in, Mark? Yeah. All right. Jack, you on? Got it. Hit it, guys. Hit it. 